How is everyone this morning? Thank you so much for being here. You could be anywhere, but you decided to be here at the third annual Head to Speech and Professional Task Force Summit. So give yourself a round of applause for being dedicated to this movement. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. I do want to, before I before we begin this morning, I do want to recognize um, our partners, our sponsors, and our in-kind supporters. Um, if you are a Head to Speech board member or a former board member, can you please stand so you can be recognized? And if you are speaking today, can you also stand so you can be recognized? Thank you so much for the Thank you. Um, today's third annual Head to Speech is Professional Task Force Summit is sponsored by Honeycomb Speech Therapy. I also would like to recognize our other partners, uh, Capture the Moment Photography, The Circle of M, Bowie TV, Pits and Push Sports Talk Radio, the Ivy Community Charities of Prince George's County, Community uh, uh, County, Ivy Vine Partners, Pathways to Excellence, Minority Women in Sports Medicine, She Loves Sports, Sports Philanthropy Network, Washington DC Chapter, DC Divas Football, Minor League Football, and Speech Time Fund. Also would like to recognize our board of directors as well in their uh, contributions to Head to Speech, Seeds of Empowerment and Significance in Athletics and Sports Magazine, My Field Goals, Serenity Speech Therapy in Kensington Academy, Jackson, Jackson um, Consultations, Partners for Health and Education, The Other Side of the Rainbow Speech Therapy, the Neuro SLP, and Kaler Beauty, which is uh, also providing sports merchandise as well. Other university affiliations that are represented today at the summit, and if you are part of this university, if you could stand. The University of the District of Columbia. Woo! Right. Our university. State University, <laughs> Woo! Hampton University, all right, Jacksonville University, all right, and Texas Tech University, I don't think she's here yet. If I'm missing a university, oh, East Tennessee State University, all right, if I'm missing a university, you can stand up and let us know where you're from as well. I'm missing a university. All right, University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Thank you for being represented. Bowie State University. Bowie State University. Thank you. Anybody else want to give a shout out to the university? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, tomorrow, we will have our Brain Health Sports and Fitness Expo as well here in the same location. And tomorrow, we will um, have our Head to Speech, Brain Health, and Concussion Recovery Care Packages. The College of Arts and Sciences at the University of the District of Columbia will have a table. The University of the District of Columbia Brain Lab will be represented. AA Athletic Consulting, Vigilance, Safety, and Training, On the Court Solutions, Modern Human, the Ivy Community Charities Partner, uh, which is It Takes a Village Collaborative will be here. Pay Yoga and Wellness, Seeds of Empowerment and Significance in Athletics and Sports Magazine, The Win Network, The Resource Key, Pits and Push Sports Talk Radio, and Minor League Football. And that is over, we'll have over 80 people here tomorrow. That's amazing. But today is about work. Today is about return to learning after sports concussions and the special considerations that we need to think about for secondary education and higher education. We're here because speech language pathologists are often left out of the conversation when it comes to sports concussion management. And I wanted to make sure that our voice was heard. I wanted to make sure that we amplified 
athletes' voices when it came to athlete brain health, sports concussion management, and the effects on cognitive communication skills. So the speakers that you hear from today, some of them have, have also experienced their own concussion recovery, have been impacted by brain health and have supported the movement. You'll hear from athletes themselves who wish they knew or worked with a speech pathologist. And if we're not working with, if we're not working with athletes, that's being a disservice to that community. And it is an underserved community when it comes to speech language pathology. And that's what we're here today to make sure that we turn that around and that we are providing the next generation with the education that they need to be competent to work with that population. You're here from speakers such as Candy Waller, who is our MC. I wanted to introduce Candy Waller. Give a round of applause for our MC, Candy Waller. <laughs> I'm going to have her introduce herself. And she's going to be talking about interprofessional, the importance of interprofessional education and collaboration, and how those trans forms, those those transitional skills, right, that we that we need to be successful when working together to really bridge the gap between athletics and communication science and disorders. She represents sports. I represent communication science and disorders. It can be done, and that's why we're here. We have to show our value to the sports community and why we are needed. So Candy, I'm gonna have to have you take it over. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yo, this is exciting. A Saturday morning, and you all are here to learn and, and educate one another, and you came here to UDC. So is everyone from the District of Columbia, the DMV? Okay, well, welcome. <laughs> glad, glad that you're here. So I've kind of gone back and forth in my mind the different ways I wanted to do this, right? Because we are talking about those transferable and transitional skills that span across all things, right? So I decided on this. I said, okay, here's how we're gonna go. Let's take a journey. Each one of us, think about some of the things you love to do when you were 10 years old. Take a moment, close your eyes, whatever it is that you need to do to dig deep about what were some of the things you just love to do when you were 10. What were some of the things that you even said? Somebody said, you know what? You are really good at this. You are really, you know what? Like, you do this a lot. What was on your report card when you were 10 years old? And while you're thinking about that, let me tell you what was on my report card when I was 10 years old. And you all might have seen this meme. She's a great student, but she talks too much. <laughs> she talks too much. She likes to talk. Um, I was typically friends with those that would listen because I was always the one that was talking. <laughs> and then I said, wait, wait, maybe they have something to say, right? And I pause there to see if anybody wants to share what they were good at. What are the things they really enjoyed when they were 10? Anybody want to share? Please. Reading and writing. Okay, another one. Cartwheels, black flips. Cartwheels, black flips. Dear Living on the edge. Yes, Okay, so 
Let's move up a notch, right? What are some of the things you really love to do when you were in college or in your young adult years? And while you're thinking about that, let me kind of connect the dots from 10-year-old candy to college candy. Still like to talk. <laughs> I was convinced I wanted to be a psychologist. I want to talk to people about their problems. I forgot the point that they're supposed to talk to me. I want to talk to them. I want to tell you about your problem. And so it was still a lot of fun. I ended up having a love for sports and just watching the game. It didn't matter. As long as they were competing, I was going to sit there and watch and figure out what they were doing. Right? Like, wow, how do you get that? Grit. How, how, do you, how do you get that athleticism, that strength? That takes a lot to do that. And I'm just sitting here watching and I'm tired. So I'm sure that they're very tired as well. But I always remembered, okay, in college, I still like to do what? Talk. So think about five, 10 more years, whichever. You know, some of y'all might still be within that time frame. I was a consultant at Deloitte, but you couldn't tell me nothing, all right? Because I wasn't gonna be a psychologist because, huh? I gotta sit there and listen, who has time for that? But you know, active listening is a part of communication, let me just say that, I poo poo that out. You're supposed to actively listen and that is a way of engagement as well. But I was a consultant at Deloitte and I was just on the top of the world, doing what? getting paid to tell people about their problem. <laughs> here's what's wrong with your organization and here's how we're here to help. <laughs> leading conversations, leading presentations, in the back of my mind all day long, what would I say? If I could do anything in this world, I would talk about sports. But I'm in the business world, traveling everywhere, they send me to tell people about their problems because ultimately that's what I really wanted. Now I'm going to give you guys another chance. Five, ten years up from college, or wherever it is that you may be, what did you like to do? Okay, back then. Pro bono, speech services in the Bahamas. Oh, no. No, in the Bahamas, that was the CC. You didn't add that in there, not just anywhere. In the Bahamas, that's the key one there. I could agree with uh, Tessie's story, but I was, as well, I was traveling a lot doing the consultant work after college, mm -hmm. so it was kind of a change of pace. So. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Anyone else? So take what you did when you were 10, what you did when you were in college, what you did a few years or a couple of years after that, and think for a moment all of those things that are tied to what you do today. Today, I talk sports every single day, and I get to tell teams what their problem is. <laughs> and if you watch any of the sports in this town, that's a lot of talking. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> but uh, not even, maybe they're not listening, but at any rate, whoever would, <laughs> they get told. <laughs> You're proud. But at any rate, it becomes a, the thing I love to do when I was I still do it now. The thing that I did in college, the thing I did at IBM, the thing I did at Deloitte, the minor corporation, what I do for Seawall Sports and Entertainment at Bowie TV, what I'm doing right now is the thing I was good at when I was 10. If you really think about those things in your trajectory, in your journey, somebody has said, talks too much is a bad thing. No, not really. Depends on the situation, right? But you think about all those things and then that brings out who your true self. Don't forget about the things that you really were good at, that you did freely, 
without a class, without a session, without any of those things. Because more often than not, it's part of who you are and what you do really well today. I'm here to tell you, because I'm a living example of it, and I see some of you nodding your head because you're probably realizing, you know what? That is kind of what I do today. You may not be on the basketball court, but I guarantee you whatever it was that you had to do in order to be a basketball player, you do that today. It follows you. So when we talk about transferable skills, those are those skills that you may not realize had, but they're effective for every job that you actually do well at and actually love. Because here's the other thing that I've learned. Just because you're good at it doesn't mean you love it. So you're actually good at it and you're actually love it at the same time. Now, if we all wait, all focus now, what are, what are those skills? What are those things I bring to the table that I'm really good at and I actually love? Compare that and look at why we're here today. I don't Because I'm actually loud. Because I'm actually loud. Because I'm Think about why we're here today in the education and understanding around athletes' brain health. I didn't know really anything about concussions. You report on them. I report on them. I am a sports broadcaster. I am a journalist. I can tell you what they said. They have a concussion. I'm just going to repeat it. But I don't necessarily understand what does that mean. Or is it going to be our one game, two games? Who can talk to me about concussion protocol? And come, Dr. Bowen. Who would think that Dr. Pope and I would have really much in common because of the lanes and the work that we do? When in actuality, we have a lot. Because now she's in a position to educate me on what that means. Concussion. Okay, what does that mean? What can the player do? What can they not do? How long? What does the uh, kind of uh, return to learning or return to the field, the court, what does that look like? as well as educate on the number of different ways you can get a concussion. Why would a sports broadcaster care about that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because whenever a player gets injured, what do people want to know? When are they coming, when are they coming back? When are they going to be back on the field? When are they coming back? I don't know. i got to call Dr. Boop and ask her. She knows. She can tell me. I'm not going to Google that one. But just in that example, I was able to share, take you through the journey of what you good at, what you love, what you do now, why we're here, why it's important to educate and know, and what we're bringing to the table. Because see, there's also, in my field, in sports broadcasting, sports media, and journalism, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Oh, you got a concussion. Oh, he got a little dizzy. He all right. Get him out of the Go away. Because we got to win the Super Bowl. Everybody go. Dr. Pope is going to inform on something very different. And oftentimes, in my field, people may not want e even to be informed. Because who wants to hear you can't play? Any questions? I have a question. Yes. Okay, so I just finished watching a documentary about a reporters in the locker room, mm -hmm. all right, um, and uh, the fight to be in the locker room. But yeah. it's, it's not about being in the locker room, it's about access. Yeah. And so can you talk to us about any barriers you had to overcome as a black woman in sports on the professional side and then access? Um, yes, <laughs> um, all the time, every day. Um, it's it is still something that is not the norm to have women in the locker room and not black women in the locker room. I mean, that's just the reality of where we are, and it becomes a. I will have a badge on, media badge, anything, and I will still have colleagues say, "Who, who are you here to see?" Who are you here to 
see. I guess the same person you're here to see. Group of folks. Oh, I thought maybe that was, you know, you dating one of the guys. It's one of your son. You baby mama. Like, come on. I'm wearing the same bag you are. And you still are asking me that question. So there is definitely still a fight to prove that you know enough to even be badged, credentialed. What possibly could you know about football you didn't play? You didn't play basketball, now if you played, you could get a little bit more credit, but if you did not play, and you've been a known spectator like myself, you're like, come on, you don't know. So there's a constant area of trying to prove yourself in order to get the access. Now in, in the reverse with players, they just want their privacy. You know, they just feel, you know, there is a sense of it's just too much access. And that is actually something I'm going to be speaking about tomorrow with the athletes about media training because, you know, there are some, I have varying thoughts on that as myself just to share. You know, you missed a game winning shot. Do you want to what? what how'd you miss the shot? Well, I mean, I do that. Maybe I wouldn't have missed the shot. I don't know. I mean, and so I can laugh and joke about that because I'm like, sometimes you got to be able to read the room. Emotional intelligence is something that is a requirement for this business, and most don't have it. I'm just telling on myself, telling on my colleagues here, but it's the truth. Nobody wants to talk about missing the game when it field goal right now. Nobody wants to talk about getting blown out in a must-win game, but they are in required for their job that they have to, because they have to. Sometimes we feel like we gonna bombard your locker room while you're trying to get dressed. So it's two issues there. One to get credentialed and the other is just simple privacy. I have a question with you being around athletes and in the realm firsthand more often than the rest of us, I'm sure. Um, what is the reception of this kind of awareness or education to the players, the coaches? Like what, are, are they receptive of it or are they pissed? They are, they, I will say this. There's still a need to not cringe when you say the word concussion. We've talked about this with Dr. Pope. You know, he says, oh, you said you gotta say brain health. I'm like, just say it. It's a, con it's a concussion. Say what it is. And the reason why, though, that's just a candy waller thing, though. Let me be clear on that. It's because it's attached to whether or not you can play. The Washington Commanders have had a player, I don't know if anybody's any Commanders fans in here, Jordan Reed, who had, what, seven, eight concussions? And he eventually retired. It's, it's just too many. And then it becomes the conversation of, don't let your kids play youth football, don't do this, the brains aren't developed. It is a very touchy subject. But right now, which is a great time for the work that you all are doing, it's time for that education and awareness because if there's things that you can do in a proactive manner that are more predictive, it helps to ease it, right? If there's exercises and things that a player can be doing and an a, a organization as large as the and, and, and others, soccer, it's another um, area in, in Major League Soccer where many concussions happen and some don't get reported. There was an incident, I can tell this, but I won't tell who it was, where I, where I could visibly see something is wrong with this player and I went and told a trainer. Is something wrong? Now he took a big hit, but hey, you can keep on going because that's what you, you're expected to keep going. You're expected, they want you to go out there with a broken leg, they don't just win. But you have to, that's part of the awareness. Now, I'm not, if, you know, who would I be to say, and that's me being bought into this, that's why I got an ambassador badge right here, because <laughs> I'm bought into the message and the work that you all are doing in this space, where I felt empowered to say, is he okay? Because I saw I saw a couple of stumbles, and I saw a helmet come off and a, and a do like this and that, and then he put his helmet back on like he was okay, you might want to check it out. He, in fact, had a confession. Me in fact, I am, I'm just like, don't fall out over here near me, because I don't know, cameras, but it's just, you know. 
I was concerned for different reasons, but no, I'm just joking. But no, it was concerning. This is, he was clearly hurt. He was clearly there's something going on. So awareness is needed, but we all have a part in that. Because as a journalist, as a media person, we're always watching. And sometimes we care more about the story than the athlete. So I hope that answers your question. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you for sharing the moment you've had in your career. An intense moment I've had in my career? Um, yeah, sure. Let me see. Um, um, there was a time where I was actually, um, I had been credentialed and then I was notified that I was no longer credentialed because the organization was no longer um, allowing independent outlets in to cover the team. And I'm like, what? You know, you see my coverage, I do a great job, I'm professional, this, that, you know, you go through the whole thing. Just is what it is. That is very difficult for me. Very difficult. Now, here's the thing about, you know, I gotta throw man upstairs, and that's how God comes in. Because the opportunity at Bowie TV came up. It's television. So then I ended up going in a different way. However, when something that you work very hard for has your name on it, gets turned away once you were in, that's painful. And that hurts. Especially when you do just as much work as everybody else. If not more, because at times you are the producer, you are the reporter, you are the content creator, you are the video editor, you're doing everything. And so that was very hard. Stomach, in terms of, I've been told yes all this time and now I've been told no. So I hope that answers you.